two valuable relationships. Two valuable relationships. You probably never thought about this one being a valuable relationship. Our relationship to government. Verses 1 through 7. In verse 1 he says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Now what does subject mean? I have preached expositorily through books of the Bible most of my ministry. And it's no surprise to me that as I'm preaching through books of the Bible that God brings up a passage like this when we are in such desperate need of better government. But now listen to me. Our government in the United States of America is only as good as we are good. Now you think about that. The serious nature of our national problems has caused probably the most patriotic to ask, why should I support this government? Why should we support the government? As a believer, do I have to respect it and respond to the government? As a citizen of both heaven and the USA, which one should, should require my allegiance? Allow me to remind you that when Paul wrote this letter to the church at Rome, the church at Rome was under the Roman government. They were in under probably one of the most oppressive governments that has ever been established and was the only one around like that in their day. But Paul said, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. That word subject means in cooperation, loyal to, willingness to obey. Let me say this, and if we don't bring this nation together, this nation is going to fall. Amen. If we don't get together, some way, somehow, we're in trouble. These were wise words to this small group of believers living within a massive structure of the Roman Empire. A very oppressive government. Their quiet submission would not guarantee them peace. but at least it might allow them to accomplish what they were placed in that position to accomplish. We do not need to forget why we are here. We are here to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only reason you and I are continuing to breathe air is God wants a witness. And you and I must be that witness. The latter part of verse 1 and then verse 2 says, For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. I know what every one of you is thinking. You mean what we've got right now is appointed by God? Yes. We are getting just what we deserve. It's appointed by God. And then he says in verse 2, Therefore, who re whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. 
We are not to rebel against and refuse to obey the laws and regulations of our land unless those clearly require us to violate the moral standards God has set for us. We should not be anarchist. We should live within this structure. We must be responsible citizens as well as responsible Christians. Amen. Are there times when you should not submit to the government? Well, Paul does address that in other of his books. But he does not really address that in this passage. Believers should never allow the government to force them to disobey God. Jesus and his apostles never disobeyed the govern government for personal reasons. When they disobeyed, they were following their higher loyalty to God. And they said, we ought to obey God rather than man. We have a wonderful system of government. We have the most, we have the best system of government on this face of this earth. And if you don't believe that, then why don't you move to another country and see what you get? We have a good system. Is it perfect right now? Oh, no. Is there anyone in this place perfect right now? Their disobedience was not cheap. When they did disobey, they were threatened, beaten, thrown into jail, tortured, and executed for their convictions. If we, we must be ready to accept the consequences because we do have laws. And then verse 3 says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. I love this verse. This verse needs to be on the billboards across America. Let me start again. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but we'll just desire to do that and do that, then we don't have anything to worry about. Because let me say this to you. Your citizenship is not here. Your citizenship is up there if you're a child of God. <laughs> To be a good citizen in America encompasses many things. And I, I want you to listen to me. If you want this country to change, and we have a wonderful process, then we need to get off our behinds and go to the polls and vote. And if we are a good child of God, then we ought to be asking all of our neighbors, are you registered? Amen. And if you're not, they're not registered, then we ought to take them to get registered. And then when the November comes, we ought to take them to the polls so they can vote. Amen. What's happened in our country today is we, we gripe and mully grub and gripe and mully grub, and we are doing nothing to change our nation. So what should we do? We should vote. Oh, this is a good one. Pay your taxes. You know, I don't mind paying my taxes. I don't want to pay no more than I have to. Amen. But our government needs our taxes. Pay your taxes and then live according to the biblical principles of conduct laid out for us in His Word. As a good citizen, we can let our light shine by living like Christ. 
You know, I, I've heard all of this and all this about our country and how bad a shape it is in, and I think we're all very much aware of how bad our country, is, the shape of our country is. But we all need to get busy and get ready for Election Day in November and swarm those polls with as many Christians, as many people that are standing for right as we can, and change the direction of this land. Amen. Verse 4 says, For he, the government, is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. Be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. One of the ways our nation gets into trouble is when we get soft on punishment. And what have we done through the years? We are patting people on the back for wrong things. Our government is one that is supposed to bring punishment. But when a country fails to do that, when we get soft, now you probably not heard many preachers say this, so you just listen to me. Like these, kid, these people that are going in these schools and killing these innocent children. I think our government ought to put them in the center on Court Square somewhere under a firing squad and start shooting them from their ankles all the way up. And if they knew that was going to happen, we would have a whole lot less people walking in our school shooting our little children. And this guy that, that killed all those people up here in, in, in Florida, you know, in that school, they're, still, they're, they're having trial after trial for him. They're having a trial now for him to de determine whether we're going to put him in prison or to give him the death sentence. I'm an Old Testament preacher. A tooth for a tooth and an eye for an eye. Amen. We're too soft. How can we fix that? Go to the polls in November. Amen. Not march on Washington, D.C. in some chaotic riot but march on those, poll, those polling stations and, and vote and vote and vote. I can remember a day, and I know you can, when we never locked the doors of our houses. I mean, I, I can't, I, I don't remember when we started locking our doors, but I mean, we, we, when I was a child, we never locked our doors. And you could leave stuff out in there, you could leave tools out in the yard. All oh, week or two at a time, grass growed up right. But, but you, when you got ready for them, they were still there. But we don't have that today. It's terrible that we're trying to sell all kinds of security systems and camera systems and. And, and, and I have a sawed-off shotgun beside my bed. And my wife and I both have concealed carry permits that we carry guns with us all the time. Somebody said to me, Preacher, do you think you could really shoot somebody? I said, yes, I, I'll tell you what. If I saw somebody shooting some innocent person, I would have not one iota of a thought of not shooting that person. And the guy that we took our training through in our concealed weapons school, he said, don't you ever pull that gun and what you're not gonna kill that person. 
I think we need to arm our teachers. And everybody needs to know they have a gun. That, that needs to know that they know how, how to use that gun. And it looks like to me we're going to have to uh, arm all of our sales personnel in the, in the store. But let me say this, our form of government, and this is not me, I found this and I just, I liked it. Our form of government is the first of its, of its kind considered a great experiment when it was established. It has survived for almost 250 years, about 246 years. For the first time, the citizens had a say in the government. This was unheard of in days past. As a constitutional republic, we are more blessed than any other people who have ever lived. The government of, by, and for the people is from God. God has blessed this nation. And then Paul says in verse 5, Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Believers have two good reasons to submit to their government, that is to avoid punishment and to heed their own conscience. True citizenship is rarely rewarded. Faithfully carrying out our small duties may not gain us any recognition. But Paul reminds the Romans and us, nobody else may notice, but God does. I thought about uh, Bobby Hudson's little girl when I was doing this message. We was back in the gymnasium. I think it was for the fall festival or whatever, and we was sacking up candy, and I told her, I said, we need to eat some of this. I said, nobody's watching. <laughs> and she was just a little thing. And she just, it, it was like she just ripped my heart out. She looked at me, and she said, God is. <laughs> out of the mouth of babes. Nobody may be recognizing and giving us any recognition for being great citizens of America, but God is watching. Amen. God is watching. Verses 6 and 7, he says, For because of this you also pay taxes. Oh, here we go again. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes due, custom to whom customs, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. As most of us remember, this builds on the principle which Jesus gave in his teaching, render unto Caesar, Caesar those things which are Caesar's, and to God those things that are God's. our relationship to government. Be subject. Think. And use all the tools that we have at our disposal to make this nation great again. And I'm here to tell you it's not going to matter who's in the White House. It matters who's in our house. Jesus is the one that's going to change this nation. Secondly, our relationship to others. He says in verse 8, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. 
Many people read this verse and they see the first part of it. Oh, no one anything. This has nothing to do with economics. While it is likely true that God, God's best for us would be for us not to incur a whole lot of debt, debt hinders you in a lot of ways. But it is equally true that to take this one passage and make it all about money is to, is to lose the meaning of this verse. What it is saying is, owe no one anything except to love one another. Our nation is so divided we can't love each other. The things of God, whether they are saved or not, we need to think about people. You know, if you... Let me just give you... This is not even in my notes. Don't let your family ever borrow anything. Some of you's going like this. Some of you may have something that your family's got. <laughs> but really and truly, you should. No one should be indebted to you, and you should not be indebted to no one else. And I say that on a personal basis because when you meet somebody and the number one thing on your mind is what is their relationship with God? But if they owe you or you owe them, the first thing on your mind is they're thinking about I need to pay them. That's what Paul's talking about here. He said, don't get, don't get off of your focus. Don't get off of your purpose. We are here to tell people about Jesus. And every time we come in contact with somebody, that ought to be, are they right with the Lord? Or do they know the Lord? Are they living in sin? But if you owe somebody something, you're thinking, boy, they want me to pay up. The foundation of love is the love of God. And we need to make sure everybody has that love of God. Jesus said in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then he says in John, 1 John 4, 8, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So let me say this. If you're, having a, if, you're having, if you're having trouble loving me, then you need to get right with God. <laughs> Amen. There we go. If I'm having trouble loving you, then I need to get right with God. The foundation of love is to love God. We cannot give what we don't have any more than we can tell what we don't know. Verse 9 says, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You know why we have all of these things, adultery and murder and stealing and bearing false witnessing and coveting. You know why we're having all this garbage going on in our lives today? It just seems like it's just all around us. Because we don't love each other. We don't respect each other. Somebody says, who's my neighbor? A neighbor is more than just your next door person. Let me share this with you. Somebody's building a house next door to me, 
and then behind me over on another corner, and I think they're fixing to build them on another on another corner. I built, I moved out there because we were in the country in the city. I told Carmelita the other day, I said, welcome to the city. But it's more, a neighbor is more than that. A neighbor can be of any race, creed, social background. Red and yellow, black and white, we ought to love them. We ran into a, a, a little black boy up in Sam's yesterday and uh, got to talking to him and uh, he, would, he wanted to know what I did. And I said, well, I've been a preacher for about 40 years. He looked at me and he said, you know, I read a verse every morning. And he was talking about going to church. He told us what church. I don't remember what church in Fort Myers he goes to. We have a friend that's a pastor over there. We Carmelita got that out and asked him if he knew him, but he didn't know him. He's a black pastor in Fort Myers. It doesn't matter what color they are. Blood is blood. When we all get to heaven, I think we're all going to be the same color. Because we're going to have a glorified body. And if we can't get along with people down here, we're going to have a real problem up there. Amen. How does all this play out? Verse 10 says, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. This kind of love transcends feelings, emotions. It's a love which brings joy and leads to respect and ushers peace. I want you to watch a video here just in a second. Because I don't want you to leave here thinking that Dennis said this stuff. What you need to do every moment of your day is listen for the voice. Listen to the voice. I was in Alaska doing a lawsuit. We're way out in the Aleutian Islands, getting ready to leave and go back to Anchorage and then home. And I had a ticket in my pocket to get on an airplane. My pastor came up and he said, listen, I can save you money. I said, how's that? He said, I flew a small airplane up here and I fly a small airplane and I can take you in my little airplane and you can save your ticket. And this did not sound, I said, gee, thank you so very, very much. But I've got this ticket. We'll just make our way on home, me and this other lawyer with me. He said, no, 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 you got to do it, you got to do it. And against every better judgment I had, I said, okay. Well, we went out to the airport, took us by his little plane, and I looked at it, and I thought, well, one good thing, it's shiny. Then he walked around it. We got in. He's on the left front, I'm on the right front. The other lawyer's sitting right behind me. And he started it up, and it started up just fine. Well, we taxied out. I said, should we pray? He said, yeah, that's a good idea. We normally don't. I said, well, this time we're going <laughs> to. And I'm telling you, I prayed five, eight minutes. I prayed a long time. We went and got on the runway. He starts down the runway. The plane lifted off ever so gently, and we start climbing. And it's wonderful. Not a problem in the world. We started climbing, and we flew probably three, four minutes. And something happened that will never leave my mind. The pilot turned to me and he said, we're going in the clouds and I can't fly in clouds. They make me pass out. Oh, I said, clouds make you do what? <laughs> now it's been cloudy all day. And we go right up into the clouds and you can't see anything. And he looks at me and his eyes roll back in his head. And he starts mumbling and he passes out passed out cold. Now I grabbed him and I shook him and I said, come on, you got to wake up so I can kill you. Now we're in the clouds <laughs> flying along with no pilot. And my friend in the back seat said, we're dead, aren't we? I said, there's a very good chance of that. Yes. 
He said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. But there was a radio right there, and I handed him the microphone, and I said, start asking for help. So he's in the back seat reaching up, and he said, hello, hello. We didn't know any proper radio etiquette. All we were saying was hello. And somebody answered back, hello, hello. Don't you guys know proper radio etiquette? And I said, good. Yeah. I said, tell him, we don't know nothing. Tell him we're in an airplane with a passed out pilot, and we don't know how to fly this plane. The guy said, I'm a freighter flying out of Anchorage on the way to Tokyo. And he said, you're telling me you have nobody who can fly that plane with you? I said, tell him that's correct. Now, you got to understand, I am sweating bullets. He said, the first thing I'm going to do is start circling so I don't lose you. Because I'll fly out of range of your radio and you won't have me anymore. And he said, I'm going to get Anchorage Emergency for you. And Anchorage Emergency will be the people that can maybe help you try to save your life. After about five minutes, Anchorage came on and said, we understand you have a passed out pilot. And those of you do not know how to fly that plane. He said, that's right. They said, well, the first thing we got to do is find you. And I'll never forget what this man at Anchorage said. He said, my job is to get you home safe. He said, that's my job. But he said, here's the deal. If you want me to get you home safe, you got to promise me you'll obey my voice. He said, you can't see me, but I can see you. And he said, if you're not going to obey my voice, you're going to die. When you can't see anything, you have no idea how disorientated you become. Finally, he said, okay, I found you. Now hear me clear. He said, you're four minutes from a mountain. He said, you're going to crash in that mountain and die. Follow my voice. I never said, I have to follow your voice. Is that reasonable? You see, I understood without his voice, I had nothing. And do you understand? Without God's voice, you have nothing. Nothing. Finally, he got us turned. And he said, I'm freezing all the traffic in the area. He said, it's going to take me an hour and a half to get you to Anchorage, and there's a lot of weather between you and Anchorage. You're in for a rough ride. And he said, I want you to hear me. I don't want you to look at what's going on outside. I don't want you to pay attention to the storm, just my voice. He said, if you start watching the storm, you will die. But I'll take you through it. Now, because they cleared all the traffic, several pilots those nighttime freighters, those 747s, started talking to us. They said, we're praying for you, men. You're going to make it. But listen to the voice. That's the key. They said, trust the voice. You realize your head is full of voices. And everybody in this world wants to talk to you. And everybody wants to be the controlling voice. And God says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. I want you to put yourself on the altar and let my voice be your voice. Amen. Finally, we went through the worst of the weather, but there was still more. And then the voice came back and it said, now, I'm going to line you up. He said, I'm going to bring you in right down the runway. And at the foot of the runway are some lights, and they're in the form of a cross. He said, don't you forget this. The cross is the way home. <laughs> Finally, he's bringing us down. We still can't see anything. And all he kept saying was, stay with me. My sheep, the Bible says, hear my voice and they follow me. Finally, just a couple hundred feet off the ground, we saw the cross. I landed the plane. In fact, I landed it seven times. <laughs> Finally, it all came to a stop. And the minute we stopped, the pilot woke up. The voice said, Thanks for listening. I watch them crash and burn all the time because they won't follow my voice. They don't understand I'm the one who can see them even when they can't see me. But they get the voices in their head and they kill themselves. They self-destruct. <clears throat> Thanks for listening to the voice. Then they put us in a motel room at about four in the morning knock at my door. I opened the door and a man was standing there. He said, hello, David. I said, you're the voice. You're the one who got me home. He said, I am. Do you understand one day you're going to stand before him and say, you were the voice. You're the voice that brought me home. If you're not on that altar as a living sacrifice, 
your head's full of voices. And then we wonder why kids crash and burn. We wonder why marriages are shattered. And the Lord's saying, I'm the one who has the voice. All I can remember is that voice saying, stay with me. Stay with me. Don't listen to what's going on in your head and don't watch the storm. Stay with me. And I'll take you through. Tonight you have a God who has promised to take you through. A living sacrifice holy. We're going through some hard times right now. Difficult times. Probably the hardest times that we've ever had in our lives. Our pilot has passed out. Don't crash and burn. Listen to the voice. Listen to the voice. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in to him and sup with him and he with me. If we're going to make it through this trouble, troublesome times, because you see, we're just passing through, just like they were flying, they were just flying. We're just passing through. We're pilgrims in this land. But if we're going to make it home safely, you got to listen to his voice. Listen to his voice. And I guarantee you, if you'll do that, Oh, you're still going to have some struggles. The mountain was still there. The storms were still there for them to fly through. But he listened to the voice. And he landed safely. I don't know where you are in your walk with the Lord. I don't know if you're trying to depend on yourself and on your own ability, your own wisdom, your own knowledge. Let me tell you something. I am 